Andrew probably doesn't need much introduction. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Andrew, but just in case, um, not only is he a gifted stand-up comedian, as well as a regular newspaper columnist and magazine columnist, um, he um, is also the creator of um, the wonderful uh, satirical Twitter account, Titania McGrath. Um, he's the author of Free Speech and Why It Matters. Um, he is the co-convener of Comedy Unleashed at the Backyard Comedy Club. And um, something uh, even his fans may not know, he also has a doctorate, I think, in romantic poetry from Oxford. So a polymath um, uh, by any measure. Anyway, Andrew, thank you very much for agreeing to participate in this uh, speakeasy and um, uh, welcome to um, welcome to our channel. Uh, thank you very much, Toby. I really appreciate the invitation and for everything you're doing. I think uh, everything the Free Speech Union is doing is really, really important. It's getting more important by the day, I think. Thank you. Uh, now, I wanted to open with um, a quote from Johnny Rotten that someone sent to me yesterday. And I guess I should caveat this by saying I haven't actually checked that he said this. It sounds like him, but he might not have actually said it. But let's hope he did, because it's quite good. Um, uh, so Johnny Rotten um, apparently said quite recently, I never thought I'd live to see the day when the right wing would become the cool ones, giving the middle finger to the establishment and the left wing becoming the sniveling, self-righteous, twatty ones going around shaming everyone. Um, now, um, I wanted to ask you, Andrew, do you think that's broadly correct? And if it is, how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, that certainly sounds like him, doesn't it? So I think that's probably the case. More and more you're getting these sort of um, punkish figures from the past uh, coming out and saying things like this because of course they were always about throwing you know throwing two fingers up to the establishment um and unfortunately now what's happened particularly in the creative industries particularly in the arts music comedy uh drama is that they've just become very establishment i think it's confusing when we start talking about left and right though because this new movement i mean i know we can get into various debates about what the movement is called i tend to call it the critical social justice movement i think it's probably the most accurate colloquially it's known as the woke movement but what it is is a a a, uh, a way of looking at the world through the lens of group identity this obsession with with uh, group identity and uh and in addition to that a, a mistrust of free speech because they have this belief that our perception of the world is entirely constructed through language and therefore if you feel that way you have to clamp down on language to to uh, to make a better world so that's w what it is and they have infiltrated all of our major institutions be they political educational academic artistic uh, the media etc and they've become the establishment but whether they are left they call themselves left wing but i've never you know they, they don't seem to prioritize social mobility or the concerns of the working class in fact they seem very often to have a disdain for working class people uh because they see them as this that sort of petri dish, dish of racism and white supremacy and all the rest of it so um i think a group or an ideological group that calls itself left wing but isn't in fact it's more obsessed with middle class concerns so arguably it's more a right wing movement has infiltrated these institutions and it's come to the point where to push back against the establishment you end up uh, more and more siding with those on the right. I, th I think it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre situation. Do, do you sometimes find it a bit uncomfortable to ah. find yourself alongside people like me? Um, you know, strange bedfellows in no. this. Um, yeah. in this <laughs> I mean, not, not... <laughs> deeply uncomfortable, Toby. No, um, not at all. I mean, look. You know, think of yourself as, as, a, as someone um, of the left rather than a conservative. Well, I guess I guess I, you know, I, I was always associating with uh, creatives and comedians and writers and actors who overwhelmingly um, perceive themselves to be left wing. Um, and so I didn't you know, I didn't know many right wing people. And I'm sure I bought into the the monstering of various figures in the media, figures such as yourself. I think people as you know, uh, are very unfair about and create a version of you that doesn't really exist, you know? And so, and I think, I'm sure I was as guilty as anyone else of buying into those things. But then, you know, in my, in my when, once you start standing up for free speech and you start meeting people uh, who have been monstered in the past and you realize, oh, they're not like that at all. They're really nice. And they're really, and they're really 
authentically progressive and they're you know and they're 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 good people so um do i find it odd i i mean i i wouldn't i hadn't expected uh to end up end up here but i think my understanding of politics was quite simplistic back then as well so i think it's probably just learning a bit more about the world and i guess you probably had a taste of um finding yourself in the trenches alongside uh political foes um mm -hmm. when you were a pro-brexit supporter during yeah. the eu referendum but that didn't make any sense to me because Brexit to me was was a no brainer from a left wing perspective. I've you know the the left has never been pro the EU as you know, and the, 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 I, it, all of these sort of great luminaries of the left have campaigned endlessly to get us out of it, including of course Jeremy Corbyn. Um, so it, it it made little sense. Uh, I think Brexit was the start. Brexit was the start of this kind of this curdling of 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 general rationality everything sort of spiraled everyone went a bit mad didn't they after brexit and you 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 know you, you suddenly found people again calling themselves left wing and lining up behind david cameron and saying they're going to do what david cameron says in support of this uh, this corporate trading block uh, that is largely run by at least center right candidates if not outright right wing candidates it it made you know it it made no sense at all to me um but I, I soon realised that the debate had become not really about the issues, not really about the EU. Most of the people who were voting didn't know what the European Commission was or how it worked or how it operated. They were voting along tribal lines all of a sudden and all of a sudden to vote leave or vote remain suddenly. Made, I mean, I think there were good arguments on both sides. And I think and I respect who, whoever voted and for whatever reasons they voted. Um, but all of a sudden it became a binary idea of good and evil. And ever since then, I think. And I'm sure there's been elements of this in the past. I don't know what you think, but ever since then, it feels like every issue gets reduced to this binary of either you're on the wrong wrong side of history or the right side of history, either good or you're evil. You either want to wear a mask or you don't want to wear a mask. You know, you either voted Tory in the last election or you or you didn't. And it's endlessly to the point where when you know someone's opinion about a political view, I, I can generally predict every other opinion they have on every other issue because there's an establishment consensus about what is the right way to think. And that establishment consensus is connected to this now very, very powerful uh, ideological movement. And it's quite depressing because it means, of course, that people aren't thinking for themselves. There used to be debates, didn't there, between between people on the right, sort of debating, ideas, between people on the left. Now it's more like um, a football game. Now it's more about tribalism, it seems to me, anyway. So... One thing I'm curious about is that um, uh, this ideological movement, whatever you want to call it, um, even if it's uh, wrong um, and sort of um, uh, historically ignorant to um, describe it as left wing, uh, you know, it's obviously more complicated than that. And many woke authoritarians have more in common with Mary Whitehouse than they do with George Orwell. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, um, many people on the left and not just young people, um, have been swept up by this movement. Um, they've gone along with it. They, 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 they find themselves absorbed into identity politics. Um, uh, more so, I think, than, than people on the right. Um, but what I'm curious about is why not everyone? Um, how is it that um, some pockets of left-wing opinion have managed to resist uh, being swept up uh, by this movement. Is it ideological? I mean, in your case, um, you always belong to um, a kind of maverick strand within the left, and you've been linked to um, Spiked and um, people like Claire Fox and Brendan O'Neill for some time, and they're of the left, but in a kind of maverick libertarian way. Is it because, is it, is it an idea, it, did, that, did that kind of um, ideology provide you with the antibodies you needed to resist this kind of ideological virus, or is it more temperamental than that is it that just you just find yourself quite an independent minded kind of stubborn character who just generally resists being swept up uh, in kind of group think of any kind well i, I mean i i always qu question everything and i think I, I i'm i'm never comfortable if i feel that i'm what i'm what i'm the views i'm expressing are the popular view not not that i'm a contrarian and that i'm going to go against the popular view it, it's simply that i will I make a point of really examining it to see whether it is an authentic view I hold or whether it is just something I have picked up from the herd. I, I, you know, that kind of thing. I don't like anything where it's everyone seems to be on the same side. I mean, this is why I even walked out of a Lady Gaga concert because I couldn't bear the thousands and thousands of people all cheering the same thing. It, it, that sort of thing just makes me nervous. Um, so I, I think it's just a, a case of 
I think it's because I, I really care about critical thinking and I'm always aware that I'm going to be wrong about all sorts of things. And I'm also aware that anyone who has an open mind is bound to have, to change their mind continually through their life. So the idea of sort of, you know, pitching my flag in, in a particular set of rules that a, that a particular ideology gives me, that terrifies me. It feels like a kind of intellectual death. It feels like you're saying, well, I won't think for myself anymore. Um, whether I've got antibodies or the, it might be because I, there was a period in my life where I was very much swept along by identity politics and the and the and the power of feeling like part of a, mar a marginalized group and all the rest of it and you know and maybe having experienced that I, I i can see it for what it is and i now very much mistrust it i don't know but i i actually don't know the answer but i think ultimately the answer for all of this is is uh we need more dissent not just in terms of between each other but but a, a kind of humility a, an awareness that an openness to to be to be persuaded of another point of view, I think is something that all of us should strive to have. And very few do almost because I suppose, because it feels like, you know, if you're proven wrong, if you're challenged, it's a, it's a threat to your ego, isn't it? And I, you know, I have as much of an ego as everyone else. So I understand that, that feeling, but, but being aware of it, uh, and then you can guard against it. That I think is the best way. I don't know if that answers your question at all. Probably not. Um, you often, um, when you engage in in debates um, on Twitter with um, various opponents, and indeed in um, free speech and white matters, uh, you're often um, engaging with this idea that cancel culture doesn't really exist. Hmm. It's just consequence culture. Um, that the free speech crisis is just something that's been invented by kind of far right extremists to license hate speech. Now. Um, I wasn't going to ask you on this occasion to rebut that point of view, because I don't suppose anyone um, listening to this uh, believes it for a second. Um, but should we should we be taking at least um, some comfort from that? Because if the the people we think of as the opponents of free speech, the enemies of free speech, deny that they are and say there isn't a free speech crisis, we're not really against free speech. We just think speech should have consequences or we should limit free speech so it doesn't license hate speech or whatever. Should we take some comfort from the fact that they, they're not openly admitting that they're against free speech, they're sort of acknowledging that actually free speech is a good thing and, and they would never criticize or attack free speech. It's just, we've got the wrong end of the stick in imagining that you know that's what's at stake here. I mean, should we take some comfort from that? Yeah, probably. In so far as uh, at least the, the enemies of free speech, or at least the free speech skeptics, do implicitly recognise that free speech must be a positive thing. This is why they need to to fudge the argument. Um, but I mean, those kind of things are just an example of the way in which uh, they will uh, out outright lie or misrepresent the truth, or even misrepresent the truth to themselves. So that you know, that, given the 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 uh, the sheer volume of evidence of the existence of cancel culture. To say there is no such thing as cancel culture involves this incredible cognitive dissonance. I mean, you must. You, I mean, I think a lot of people do believe it. I, I don't think they're lying necessarily. I think some are lying. There are bad actors, but I think a lot of people do believe it because the terms become so sort of slippery when we when we when we get, you know talk about these various issues. I mean, even when it comes down to what do we call these people? You know, about five years ago they were all calling themselves woke. And then about three years ago, the same people said, we never called ourselves woke. Uh, that was just a slur invented by the right, even though we've all got Google and we can see that they all did. Um, so it's, it's, it's as though tr truth has become the casualty within this culture war. And, and when you don't regard truth as being important, you regard the outcome as being important, uh, then truth can be dispensed with. And that's what has ultimately happened. Um, so I don't know if we should take comfort that they're not willing to... <laughs> just come clean you know it'd be, I, I, in a way i'd have far more respect for those people who sort of say yes speech is dangerous speech is violence therefore we need to censor people you know and uh, and some people do just come out and say it and i think you know where you stand with people like that uh but the the people i can't stand are the ones who say no i support free speech but i but i just and then they find a way to argue for censorship <laughs> you know i mean it's 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 incoherent and it's frustrating Sometimes the people who um, argue for censorship do so in a seemingly more straightforward way, but it's still you're still not quite clear how sincere they're being. So I'm thinking, for instance, of the um, students who walked out 
of the um, dinner, the formal dinner at South College, Durham, yeah. when they discovered that Rod Liddell was going to be the after dinner speaker. And afterwards, mm -hmm. when Tim Luckhurst, the head of South College, you know, asked them why they walked out and why they didn't want to stay and listen to Rod, they said that um, this is a safe space. This is our home. You know, we don't want to feel threatened and um, feel unsafe in our home. The same argument was made, you know, to the what the Christakis's um, at, um, at, what was it, uh, uh, Yale? Or was it? it yeah, was Yale, it was Yale. Yeah. Yeah. When 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 when, um, uh, when they complained about, was it Christina Christakis? Um, uh, it was er er Erica Christakis, wasn't it? Erica Christakis. When yeah. she when she when she said that, um, yeah, perhaps we shouldn't make too much of a fuss about cultural appropriation in Halloween costumes. Yeah. All these students protested that they made them feel unsafe. They, they were entitled to feel safe, protected from these kinds of um, threats and dangerous speech in their home because it was their home. And I always find it hard to work out whether when when, stu when students make this argument, whether they're being sincere, whether listening to Rod Liddle really does make them feel unsafe, you know, that, they, that it actually causes them severe anxiety and they feel suddenly vulnerable and exposed and as though it's going to kind of plunge them into some kind of psychological or mental crisis. Uh, that's the impression they give. But are they just pretending that it's going to have that effect on them? Are they weaponizing their kind of um, claimed psychological fragility or do they really believe it do you think well i think my default assumption is always to believe that what people say that people mean what they say because i don't think you can you can endlessly speculate about whether someone is is being honest or not but if, if an argument is is weak it will collapse under scrutiny irrespective of whether or not it is sincerely held so i think the the, the, the safest approach is just to assume that they they do believe it. I mean, having said that, you know, I've experienced a number and seen a number of examples where someone has weaponized the, the idea of being unsafe. And it's clearly been a ploy to have someone else lose their job or whatever. That happened to me when I was teaching a stand up course. And one of the uh, members of the group, young, young stand up, claimed that they felt unsafe because of a joke I'd told online as to Tanya. And uh, therefore, I was told my contract wouldn't be renewed. And that was clearly a ploy. There's no way that being in a room with me makes you unsafe I'm, I'm a physical coward for one thing I'm not strong uh, but also you know the idea that a joke I told has jeopardized anyone's safety no one believes that but the theatre mm -hmm. went along with it immediately uh, and they had to because it was suddenly a health and safety issue um, so you know certainly it is weaponized and certainly it is deployed disingenuously that has to be the case and we've seen so many examples at the same time uh, I have seen evidence of uh, an authentic feeling of despair at the prospect of hearing views that you haven't heard before or that you find uh, uh, difficult to to deal with. And, um, you know, I remember talking to Brendan O'Neill about this. He'd been at, um, he was giving a talk somewhere and he said someone was in floods of tears at something he'd said and, and, it, and it was just a difference of opinion and it sort of hit him. You know, this is, the, the emotion is real um, in a lot of cases. Um, the Rod Little one's a very interesting one because I read the transcript of the students' complaints and it's exactly the phrases you were talking about, uh, about unsafe violence against my community. It was, it was stock phrases, almost like the complaint had been pieced together like a linguistic puzzle. Uh, I'll, I'll use this slogan and this slogan and that slogan uh, and just put it all together. I mean, I could have written that. I could, I, if you'd have said to me, this is what had happened, I could have written exactly what he would have written because it, it, it's coming from a script, but that does, even if you're reading from a script, that doesn't mean that you don't authentically feel the emotion, I don't think. Yeah, it, 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 that's always something that's slightly, what well, struck me about um, members of this ideological movement. As a writer, you know, um, I strive to be original, fresh, you know, try and arrest people's attention by putting things in a kind of clear and vivid, you know, way, which isn't stale, a way they haven't heard before. Mm. Um, but the opposite always seems to be the case. It's as though they're pulling down, as you say, stock phrases, particular words from a kind of bank of phrases to kind of assemble them together, whether they're writing something or whether they're, they're, they're having an argument. You notice this when, when various companies and institutions uh, en masse issued kind of mere culpa statements about racism at yeah. the height of the BLM protests in the summer of 2020. They all use the same stock phrases. You know, it's past time we should have an open conversation about race. For too long, we swept it under the carpet and so on and so forth. It was as though they were all written by the same person 
person. Yeah. And it, it, how do you explain that? I mean, I, 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 so I'm not I'm not curious about the fact that um, I'm not asking you why it is they don't strive to be a little bit more original, but they don't seem to notice they're not being original. It's kind of like they've become non-player characters, automatons, and they're very happy to just recite from a script, though seemingly not quite aware that they're doing so. Yeah, and there's, no, there's nothing new about that. So um, if you read George Orwell's essays, he repeatedly comes back to this idea of, 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 the, of the sort of middle-class intelligentsia who, who just deploy thoughtless phrases particularly surrounding the the war uh, and he hated it these sort of cliches that are thrown out there um jack boots and things like this and he, he i remember a couple of times he lists all these phrases that he hates uh, and yeah there is something about christopher hitchens used to say this as well about like if you're if you're a writer and you're using cliches it's very dangerous because you're you're they're not your thoughts then or you haven't formulated your thoughts uh in in a, in a particularly interesting way um so yeah, they do. I mean, same like you say, the Black Lives Matter statements from the various public schools and and various corporations. I mean, they all they were the same. You, they were carbon copies, um, and I think it just suggests. Well, they, there can never be any insight there. There can it can never take us any further forward. It's just liturgical cant, I think, at that point, point. Um, and that's why I that's why I mistrust it, and that's why I'd always like to talk to these people more because you know people can rattle out the slogans. Uh, like a politician who's got something to hide, uh, but then when you get them in a one-to-one -one conversation, you you can you can get to what they actually think, rather than just the slogans they're deploying. I, I, you know, I, and and it throws them whenever you challenge them on this. You know, if, if someone says the phrase "trans women are women," they expect it to be the end of the conversation. That there's a phrase it was Lifton Robert J. Lifton called it a thought terminating cliche. It's a phrase that sounds definitive. It sounds like we we don't take this any further. Uh, and there's loads of these and the, the woke left use all sorts of things like dog whistle, you know, well, what does that mean? It, it, it means we think you're secretly sending out signals to your followers, but where's your evidence for that? Well, they don't have any. So they, they just say, well, that's a dog whistle or they, or, or they say trans women are women or they have a phrase like this. And then when someone pushes back and says, okay, what do you mean by that? What, what is a woman? And then they get in a fluster and they get into these big circular arguments and ultimately it exposes them because they're not really, they're not, as I say, they're not really thinking for themselves. It reminds me a little bit about when I was a school teacher and there was another school that had not, we used to hate writing reports because you'd have to write something interesting about every student, something insightful about 300 odd students. And there was one school that had a drop down menu of, of stock phrases you could use. So uh, he needs to read more. He needs to work a bit harder. In the, and just literally, you could just populate your document with these stock phrases. It took half the time. But the, they were saying very little about the, the pupil, ultimately, because, they're, you know, <laughs> you've, you've got to, in order to uh, think, in order to uh, interrogate your own thoughts, you have to express them in your own words, not in standard phrases that you've simply uh, poached from elsewhere. So Andrew, I'm going to ask you um, one more question and then let's throw it open for um, discussion, general discussion, Q&A. Um, I've, I've often noticed that when I try and engage with, you know, um, uh, woke authoritarians by trying to reason with them, trying to present them with evidence, trying to point out the logical inconsistencies in their position, trying to get them to open up a little bit and sort of properly engage, um, uh, they're very resistant, as you say, they just use these kind of conversation stopping phrases, or they become emotional and hysterical, um, or they just walk away. Um, uh, and often, you know, they just do point blank refuse to debate in the first place. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be a very effective way then um, to, uh, to, to try and kind of uh, uh, push back against this kind of authoritarian movement. To Tiny McGrath, by contrast, makes a few gags, you know, pokes fun at them, uh, and suddenly it throws them into a complete tizzy and they go completely nuts. Um, do you think that, I mean, as, as someone who's both used both satire and kind of argumentation as a way of trying to kind of win this battle, do you think that satire is ultimately a more effective device, that that is the way to go, that taking the mickey, um, making them seem ridiculous through humour is actually a more effective way of undermining their authority, their power, uh, than just engaging with them in a much more academic way? It certainly makes them a lot more angry. I mean, the, the, the level of vitriol and venom I've had specifically for the Titania McGrath and maybe to a degree before that, some of the Jonathan Pye scripts that I'd written, these things tend to make them more 
angry than anything else. And maybe it's because it's harder to, if you're, if you're being mocked, uh, it's harder to sort of fight back in a way because other people are laughing at you. And, and uh, yeah, I think it is, I think it is effective. Uh, I don't know how effective it is. Um, uh, I know a lot of people just end up doubling down on it. I also do think there's a place for uh, rational discussion, the, making the attempt at rational discussion. When I get into arguments on Twitter uh, and I share tweets of some of the things that people are saying to me, really that isn't for them. Really this is to demonstrate to other people what, what we are dealing with here. Um, and for, for a long time, I will, I, will, I will always assume that this is a good faith approach uh, until they start throwing insults and doing all their usual tricks. And then I'll, then I'll just, then it's derailed, then it's gone and I'm not interested anymore. But um, yeah, I think, I think we can do both. I think we can, what we always, I think need to remember is that these people are a minority in every generation. You know, it's often, this whole culture war is often misrepresented as the old against the young, as older people failing to, to, to change, uh, you know, which is as old as time. That's always been the case that older people struggle with the changing world. And, and, and I'm sure I do as much as anyone else. But that's not what this is, because the woke left are a, a minority in all generations, including the very young. So it isn't that. Um, I think that's always worth bearing in mind. And therefore, because they are a minority, um, when we have these arguments, when we mock them, when we use satire, when we do all of that sort of stuff, again, it's not for them. It's for all those people on the outside who are looking at this, the spectators, the people who might be undecided about where they stand on these things. And that's where it can be most, most powerful. Uh, I mean, I have had some people contact me and say that the Titania stuff and that kind of thing sort of drew them out of it, which is quite gratifying. It doesn't happen often, but I, I do get that every now and then. And I think, OK, so maybe it does have an effect on some people. Um, uh, but I would say, yeah, we, I think we have to keep going and keep they're just the powerful minority. That's what they've just they've just somehow become the establishment and therefore they've got incredible clout. Um, but we can. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say do do both Mock, mockery, ridicule, but also rational debate because it shows that you've got the moral high ground as well okay thanks andrew so um uh jen who who, who are we going to have our first question from absolutely right this is clearly something that is trans historical cross-cultural it's something about human nature that the comfort that we feel when we when we form our little groups and, and absolutely that's always been the case i think there are elements of this that feel unprecedented but i will take on board exactly what you said i mean i I remember when I was very young reading an article by Roger Scruton talking about how people on the uh, the right have always felt that left wingers are misguided, naive, maybe stupid. But people on the left have often felt that right wingers are evil, diabolical, sinners. So that that's the perspective. And that perspective still very much is that trend still very much is the case today. I think what is, however, different is the terms of debate have become destabilized in a, in a, in a really threatening way insofar as um the the way in which the woke left uh, because they're not prepared to argue uh they will redefine the terms that they are using whilst denying that they are redefining the terms and therefore it becomes half of the battle is a language game uh is trying to navigate through their le linguistic terrain before you get to the truth i mean this is why it's very interesting watching the um maya Fostata tribunal this week which was being live tweeted someone was very kindly tweeting out everything that was being said. And because these sort of gender ideologues were forced to answer questions. So usually they just say, oh, you're a transphobe. Oh, you're being hateful. That's their, that's their default. But they couldn't do that in a court of law. And all of a sudden they're being asked, they're having their ide ideology interrogated and it just falls apart. These tweets are amazing to read. It, it, just, it's based on absolutely nothing. And for once, and this is why of course they can't afford to get into a debate. And that's why we get this this linguistic prestidigitation, this 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 destabilization of, of of the terms, that I think is very new. I, I mean, or at least, I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong. Mate, I'm sure there are historical precedents for it, but it seems to be the default now that you you can't really have an argument across these tribal lines. You can't even attempt to reach out across the tribal lines because people are arguing from completely different premises and terms, and and we don't. It's almost like we don't have a shared language anymore. And I think that that is what is different but i do absolutely take your point that the <laughs> tribal hostility is not is not nothing new it's almost certainly innate from the inception at gb news we've always made a point of always trying to get both sides heard 
and inviting guests from both sides. It's it's you know I know that the channel was uh, painted by activists months before we even launched as being a, a right wing echo chamber. Of course, they hadn't seen a minute minute of it. Um, what they mean by that, of course, is we have right wing people on the channel who express their views, and you're just not used to seeing that on TV, uh, and we're not used to having debates about certain issues on TV. So the fact that we do it at all is why people are uncomfortable. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, fair play, I think, to Benjamin and to people like him and, and the regular left-wing contributors and panelists who come on. I mean, if you ever watch any of those shows, Tonight Live or anything like that, you will always hear, you, there will always be a disagreement among the panel. And that's as it should be. And then we can hear everyone's view. I mean, I'm not interested in in inviting a guest on who disagrees with me so that I can beat them in an argument. I'm not interested in this ego nonsense. I want to hear what they've got to say and I want to attempt to understand their point of view. And some will come on. I find it a big struggle though, you know, particularly with certain debates to get people from both sides to come on. Uh, with the trans debate, I've, I've endlessly been trying to get intelligent and articulate uh, trans activists to come on and have the discussion, but they invariably say no. Stonewall I invite every week as a matter of course. I've invited them every week for about four or five months now. And they die. I've been, I'm, I'm thinking a bit like in the Shawshank Redemption, when he keeps writing to the library, they'll eventually give in and come along. I don't know. Uh, I hope they do. Cause I'd love to, I'd love to actually ask them, but you see their, their policy now is no debate. It's an official policy that they have. And that's why they failed to persuade anyone. And that's why everyone's turning against them. And that's why all these companies and government departments are pulling out of their diversity champion scheme is because they haven't attempted to persuade anyone and i suspect it's because they can't I, i've had similar things with i have debates about the statues issue you know statues coming down and and that kind of thing and i've had femi nylander uh, very kindly has come on to my show more than once to to argue he was one of the activists who was part of the roads must fall campaign and he's very passionate uh passionately in favor of, of that kind of activity and and again fair play he comes on and he makes his point and i let him make it. i don't try and interrupt i don't try and humiliate it's about hearing what people have to say and i think it's so important and you're right we just we don't we just generally don't get it on on, on mainstream media channels it, it's a shame i've got a short anecdote here about um how i was actually once quite relieved when someone declined to debate me so i was booked onto the radio for today program uh, to defend noah carl um who was a young uh, academic at a cambridge college and there was an an open letter circulating demanding that he lose his junior research fellowship because he'd written in various journals that they disapproved of. And it was kind of, they're accusing him of being kind of alt-right adjacent rather than alt-right. But as far as they were concerned, that was enough to, to damn him. And one of the leaders of uh, one of the people who pulled together this open letter was a professor of mathematics at King's College, Cambridge, who'd won this extraordinarily prestigious medal in mathematics. I think it was something like the Field Medal, but might have even been the Field Medal. It's like one down from a Nobel Prize. And I was scheduled to debate him on the Today program at like, you know, 10 past six the following morning. And I was madly swatting up the evening before thinking, God, this guy's going to run circles around me. Um, and then I got the call, you know, that, that he pulled out because he didn't feel he could share a platform with me. And I was actually a little bit relieved. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of these debates do end up just being a sort of a people locking horns. It does end up being, you know, uh, that and that kind of debate isn't very useful but i think that the kind where we all get to hear each other's views and are able to respectfully disagree and even robustly disagree all of that that's great but yeah i just wish there was more of it i know lots of people who've given up watching question time because they feel it doesn't really happen anymore on that you know and everyone's singing from the same same hymn sheet yeah i think there's been two in particular um both of them threads, tweet threads. And one of them is a, a thread about uh, things that are racist. And all that I did was I collected together newspaper articles online, uh, uh, problematizing as, as racist various things from cheese, botany, cycling, mountaineering, goats, uh, Western civilization, libraries. What, and and I, I put them all into a thread. The thread is currently something like 30 parts long and with each one, it has four screenshots. So you're talking over 120 uh, examples, not just from blogs, from mainstream media outlets saying that everything is racist. And by putting it all together like that in one place, you suddenly see how absurd it is. The absurdity just hits you right in the face. It's difficult to evade it because, because you know, I've got the receipts. So that's, that's had a difference, I think. Um, and then the other one was where I collected together the times where I've tweeted something 
and it's come true eventually. That's actually it's 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 worked out that Titan is almost kind of predicted it. And when that when that happens, uh, and it's happened quite a lot. So, for instance, in the book, in the first Titania book, I I was talking about how Helen Keller had white privilege, you know, uh, and and then an article came out. I think it was in the either the New York Times or one of those sort of uh, um, identitarian publications, and they said the same thing. And so by putting it side by side, the time that I tweeted about it and then the time when it came true, uh, it again shows that if, if it's possible to predict the, even the most absurd, that anything that I write as a fake tweet could come true in their world. And by seeing it, you know, uh, it, it, it instantly exposes the absurdity of it. Does, can I ask, Andrew, does, does, yeah. does that make it difficult to uh, maintain the satire? I mean, if... If, if you if something you come up with which is seemingly kind of the most absurd possible position you can imagine you know a kind of woke authoritarian slam poet taking yes and like three weeks later they all take that but isn't it leave you with nowhere to go <laughs> yeah to a, to an extent um but yeah I think that's absolutely right because because sometimes people will say things that are just they, it feels like I wrote it and it's it's you know it's not that and it's it's in a sense it's um well, to give an example, the what the time when I wrote about how white parents ought to send their uh, teenage daughters on unaccompanied walking holidays in the tribal regions of northern Pakistan to prove that they're not racist, you know, and then it was about two weeks later, Forbes magazine said exactly that, and it, you know, so part of me thinks, oh God, am I Mother Shipton or something? Or, but it's not that. It's just that the 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 the, the end point of the logic here is 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 actually quite easy to predict once you've read enough of it once you've got your mindset into it and it, uh, yeah i got i commonly have people say well isn't it impossible to satirize because it is self satirizing absolutely right it is it is self satirizing it makes it harder i suppose that's what it does this is the ongoing problem one of the biggest examples recently has been the word racist which all of us understand as being hatred or prejudice towards people because of their race. And everyone knows that's what it means. But because um, the woke left have infiltrated uh, the staff of uh, major online dictionaries now, they've changed the uh, definition in a number of online dictionaries. Uh, arbitrarily, they've changed it to the critical race theory formulation of racism, which is a, an equation. It's prejudice plus power. But that's not how the word is used by the vast majority of people, by the overwhelming majority of people. And of course, the dictionary's role is to record common usage, not to engineer the way in which language ought to be used. Uh, but because they have reached those positions, they are able to do so. And now, of course, people can say, no, 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 white people, uh, sorry, uh, non-white people can't be racist because that racism is an equation. It means prejudice plus power. And you might say, no, that's not what it means. And they say, yes, but look at the dictionary. There's the dictionary definition. That's what it means. So you see, that's that's the, it's the, it's it's not just the redefinition of terms. It's the fact that they've insinuated themselves into the institutions to such a degree that they can literally do so within within, the, you know, particularly in libraries, particularly in schools, online dictionaries, things where language seems to matter. And I'm not this sounds conspiratorial. I don't think it is. Uh, it, it just so happens that the people there in those positions have done that. Similarly, you'll find with them um, in Brighton, for instance, Brighton. As in, Brighton Council introduced its anti-racist school strategy. And when we hear anti-racist, we think that's brilliant because we all hate racism and we're all against racism. We're all anti-racist. Anti-racism doesn't mean that. Anti-racism uh, means that you see the world first and foremost through the prism of race. Uh, and its logical endpoint is racial segregation. Uh, so we are, I mean, I wrote an article for The Spectator about this because I was trying to grapple with this. The truth is that if you are genuinely opposed to racism, you have to be opposed to anti-racism. Um, but in order to get to that point, you have to explain, firstly, what is meant by racist, what the activists mean by racist, what the activists mean by anti-racist, and then, then you finally get somewhere. So before any arguments begin, you have to go through these torturous uh, steps to sort of make sure that everyone is, is, is following the, the identical definitions. And, you know, you've seen in America with all the, with the implementation of critical race theory in education um, and various parents now suing uh, schools as a, because it is a form of a racist indoctrination. So now the uh, practitioners of critical race theory have stopped calling it critical race theory. In Brighton, they didn't use the phrase critical race theory once in their strategy document, 
even though what they're implementing is explicitly a form of critical race theory. And in fact, uh, the councillor who was principally responsible, I think her name was Hannah Green, said in, an, uh, in, a, in a council meeting, critical race theory is the lens through which we see this stuff. So, you know, it's just it's, it's changing the language so you can do the same things. And it is it is um, it is exhausting um, because it's it's often these Trojan horse terms. I mean, even the phrase social justice, like who wouldn't be for social justice? But, you know, if, if you care about actual just, justice and actual equality, you have to be against so social justice. Um, so, you know, this and this is also why it's so difficult to resist. And it's also why a lot of good people are persuaded of the validity of the woke intersectionalist worldview because they couch their aggressive ideas in progress progressive terminology and therefore a lot of people think they're being doing the right thing uh by going along with it when it's actually against their own interest it's very very it's very difficult but it makes complete sense given that the origins of all of this is the postmodernism of the 1960s and the 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 um that that postmodernist view that that reality is constructed through language or at least our understanding of it is and so and 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 that just lives on the, the 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 ideas of Foucault and Derrida live on in the activists who have never read them but say things like jokes normalize hate language is violence speech is violence you can hear it it happens again and again As I said earlier, having to stand up in court and defend your position means that you can't just throw insults as a means to uh, to get out of it. And yet you're absolutely right. Putting that question to politicians, what is a woman? You know, so this has been a very, very significant week, I think, in terms of uh, people being peaked, as they call it, or uh, or uh, or red pilled or whatever you want to <laughs> whatever phrase you want to use, because, of course, we've had Leah Thomas. Uh, clearly a biological male uh, absolutely trashing uh, women's sports swimming records and and because we see it everyone can see it we you can't argue your way out of that that and 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 this expectation that we should just not uh, say what we can see to be true I mean that's straight out of Orwell that's straight out of 1984 that's what the party said that you weren't able to speak the uh, what you can see the evidence of your eyes and ears you know um, so there's been that there's been the NHS a scandal that Bar Baroness Nicholson raised, this Annex B scandal, effectively uh, a woman uh, alleged she was raped on a ward by a transgender patient. In other words, a male patient who was on the female ward. When the police went to the hospital, the hospital said that couldn't have happened because there were no men on that ward. And that's a policy called Annex B, where if a female patient complains and says, I don't want to be in a ward with a man, the official response among the NHS staff has to be, there isn't a man here, right? This is the very definition of gaslighting. It's 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 denying someone's observable reality in order to make them doubt their own senses. And um, that scandal, I mean, that's effectively, I think that has done a lot. I think people are absolutely outraged that that has happened. And I, you know, I've been contacting the NHS for a long time, trying to work out why in the official documentation I've seen, they keep talking about sex being assigned at birth. Where, you know, medical practitioners know it is not assigned at birth. It is observed and recorded at birth. So why do the NHS, of all people, use that terminology? Why do they, uh, you know, Andrew Lansley said in 2010, we would have, he would guarantee single sex accommodation. But in private, the people at the NHS were saying, we're going to call it single sex accommodation. What we mean is gender. Uh, I've even seen a memo, a document that says explicitly, we're not going to tell the truth to the public because they won't understand it. Right. This is ideological capture at the highest level. And it means that uh, a rape investigation has been stymied. That's how serious it is. And when these things happen, you know, I mean, we can we can say this is just the chatter of culture warriors online or in, in, in university campuses or whatever. No, this is uh, the perversion of, of, of you know, this is this is uh, uh, an investigation into rape <laughs> being prevented. This is uh, women's 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 female athletes not achieving what they could achieve because they've been knocked out by a biological male this is stuff that is actually serious and it's now embedded everywhere the labor party can't even the, the, the people in the labor party can't even admit what a woman is they can't even say it and of course that's never going to be a vote winner this is why i'm quite optimistic because no one can look at a politician who can't say what a woman is and take them seriously no you know that's not someone who you're going to put your cross in their boxes you're not going to elect that person this, this is you know so i uh, so i think this week has been pretty significant when it comes to that debate and i think more and more people are 
because everyone's terrified. Everyone's terrified of saying anything because they've seen the viciousness with which people are treated when they speak out. Mm. Um, but more and more people I've noticed now this week are being explicit. And, you know, it gets to a tipping point. Enough is enough, right? Toby will be better placed than I will to give you the actual specifics on that. I know that people have been arrested for misgendering. I know Kate, Kate Scottow was definitely arrested and put in a prison cell uh, for uh, for misgendering someone. Toby, what's the extent of that sort of thing? I can't think of a single example of someone who's actually been prosecuted mm -hmm. in the UK for misgendering someone. It normally gets recorded as a non-crime hate incident. Now, that's not nothing, as we know. That, that goes on your criminal record. And if you apply for a job working with children or vulnerable adults, um, uh, and that, that can come up on an enhanced DBS check, and it can mean you don't get the job for not having committed a crime. Um, so that's serious. Um, but as far as I know, no one has actually been um, uh, prosecuted for misgendering. So I may not be aware of this, but one of our members, um, Posey Parker, um, uh, she, she started a petition on change.org. So um, uh, uh, someone had started a petition saying they wanted the Oxford English Dictionary to change the definition of woman from adult human female to something less trans exclusionary. Um, and it got tens of thousands of signatures immediately. And Posey Parker um, uh, put up another petition, a rival petition saying, all it said was, I want the Oxford English Dictionary to keep the definition of woman as adult human female. I noticed that was on your on your T-shirt as I'm saying this. Uh, and um, change.org took down uh, Posey's petition on the grounds that defining a woman as an adult human female was hate speech. And um, that's alarming for all sorts of reasons. But one reason it's alarming is that um, uh, there's currently a bill um, going through our parliament called the Online Safety Bill. And um, Nadine Dorries, the um, Secretary of State at the De Department for Culture, Media and Sport, who's responsible for piloting this bill through the Commons, um, has said uh, that she wants to make it um, impossible uh, for, she wants to force social media companies to remove legal but harmful content. And there's going to be a, a supplementary um, piece of legislation known here as a statutory instrument in which the um, legal but harmful content that social media companies in the UK will be forced to remove on pain of being fined 10% of their annual global turnovers um, will include, I think, um, hate speech. Um, and so it's perfectly possible that once this bill becomes law, and bear in mind this is under a conservative government, um, it will be, it will be um, impossible for anyone to say on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram that their definition of a woman is an adult human female, because that'll be hate speech. So um, you rest assured the Free Speech Union is doing everything it can um, to uh, try and improve um, uh, the online safety bill. And we hope that um, uh, there'll be nothing about hate speech in the statutory instrument that Nadine Doris introduces, um, defining what legal but harmful content social media companies will be forced to remove. Um, but that's a battle we're currently fighting. I think also to add to that, the, the issue of pronouns is an interesting one because I have always been a, of the view, you know, I've known trans people in my life. And if someone goes through that procedure, I, I you know, I, I believe gender dysphoria is a thing. And I think it's it's very painful and difficult for people to go through that procedure. And if someone wants to present as the other sex and they feel that that's the only way they can be happy, I will use the opposite sex pronouns and I will use the name that they want to use. And I, it's not that I, I, I am saying it because I believe they have become a woman or they have become a man, but because I, 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 cause if you care about someone, you want them to be happy. So there's that, but what's happened of late is that because of this militancy within trans activism, which isn't trans people, it's, it's sort of the militant wing of the activist contingent of trans people, because of their uh, demands for hate speech laws against misgendering, because of their flat out denial of reality that Leah Thomas is male, they won't, they, you know, the fact that biological sex matters when it comes to single sex spaces, when it comes to women's spaces, um, more, more and more I'm, I'm, I'm finding people saying, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to, even out of courtesy to people I know, use the pronouns that they would rather I use. That, 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 in other words, what this is doing, what this militant trans activism is doing is making people more and more reluctant uh, to be supportive of trans people. Generally, in, fact, in fact, it's having, in other words, it's, make, it's, it's generating more hostility where it needn't be. And, and so, you know, Leah Thomas is a very good example, but, you know, I, I, it, 
I, I, I find myself struggling on this because it doesn't hurt me to call Leah Thomas her, but because of the infiltration of men into women's sports, I feel that's probably wrong and I should actually make a point of saying him. Um, but by the same, do you know what I mean? But by the same token, uh, well, let me, let me give you another example. This week, this story about the serial killer, what was his name, Harvey something, murdered a number of women, dismembered a woman. Uh, this, this article appeared on the BBC and it was only at the very end, it was talking about an elderly 83 year old woman has dismembered this woman and, and had been served 50 years in prison for murdering women. And I'm thinking, this doesn't sound like an elderly woman. Like it just doesn't. And at the end, the BBC put in little, it was an aside, it was literally in parentheses. This person recently identified as female. I'm like, so you've lied to us. The whole article is a lie. You're expecting, we all know this is a man. And I don't think a man who commits murder is worthy of courtesy. So I'm not going to call that person she, right? So, do, do you see the difference? That's what I'm getting at. Whereas, you know, if a friend of mine needs to present because of gender dysphoria, needs to present as the opposite sex, I will use those pronouns. And, and, and it's just a shame that we reached the point where now that's even become a kind of political statement. Does that sort of make sense? When people were using preferred pronouns in the past, it wasn't, it, there wasn't that threat to reality and truth. That wasn't in the air. No one was saying, these people actually uh, change sex because that's never happened. No human being has ever changed sex. No one was saying that's actually happened. But now with the mantra, trans men are men, trans women are women. And if you, if you don't say the, the script, even though you know it's not true. And when, when those, the stakes are now higher. And so I understand why people will flat out refuse to use preferred pronouns now. I get it. I think that's that's right um certainly the uh the leading figures within this movement uh yeah there is a, a vested interest in in uh ridding ridding ourselves of evidence-led uh rationality uh and evidence no longer matters because that's why they emphasize the idea of lived experience uh which is just what we used to call anecdotal evidence it doesn't mean anything really um and so yeah there, that is a problem but i think identity politics had its utility or certainly has its utility when there are palpably unjust systems in place. I think it made complete sense in the 1960s for black activists to work collectively in their own interests, for gay activists to do likewise. Uh, you know, I don't, for women, for, you know, I think it makes sense when there is injustice. The problem that we face today is we live in the most tolerant uh, well, it isn't a problem. It's a wonderful thing that we live in the most tolerant society that has ever existed on this planet ever. And so uh, people are manufacturing um, uh, grievances through these ideas called structural racism or structural homophobia or institutional things that don't require evidence. It's simply it's simply the assertion. They are asserted to be true. And, and of course, it is perfectly possible that there are racist structures. But to say, but you need evidence. You can't just say Oxford University is uh, systemically racist because if you're going to say that I want to I want to know what you mean by that well where where is this system who put the system in place where is it where where is it happening because all the data suggests very clearly that racism is uh, virtually non-existent at Oxford University so where are you getting this from it's just a, an assertion without evidence which is exactly what you say and this is something this is a, a more sort of toxified version of identity politics and and it, and it, and it comes about uh, you know, when things are pretty good, <laughs> that's that's the thing. It, it 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 seems to me very much. I mean, if you compare when I was a kid, no one was out. None of my friends were out. No one was. To, if you walk down the street hand in hand with someone of the same sex, you run you run the risk of being attacked. Now that risk still exists to a degree, but it's very very minimal. But back then it was a serious risk, and 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 yet, gay activists of today will behave as though things are worse than they have they have ever been. Whereas of course things are better than they have ever been. And most gay people are not even remotely oppressed in today's society in this country. They are in other countries and they're not in this country. And, and so uh, in that respect, it's a different form of identity politics to the civil rights movements where I, I think there was a need for uh, collective group action. I don't think that exists now. And yes, it seems to be all the more vehement. It's another form of control. I think in Sheffield University, there was even they were even paying students a minimum wage to spy on their fellow students and report racial microaggressions that they overheard. And you can imagine with a financial incentive, uh, you know, you'll get all sorts of reports going on there that may not necessarily be real.
it was against people's expectations. You know, early on in the pandemic, the, the predominant view seemed to be that the culture wars were over because now we were facing authentic hardship. Now we were having to deal with something that was, you know, that could kill you. And, and so therefore discussions about pronouns and statues and all the rest of it would all be consigned to the past. And of course, the opposite happened. Um, and I wrote an article about it early in the pandemic, which was called Coronavirus Won't Kill the Culture Wars. And I got mocked for this. I was like, look, this, is all, this isn't going to... And of course, it just went the other way. It, and, and, and this ties into what um, was said about, you know, are we condemned forever to this spiral? Because it is, as, as the last speaker alluded to, a religion. It, is a, it has all the accoutrements of religion. Uh, it is predominantly faith-based. Uh, it is impervious to reason. Uh, it, it, but it's a particular kind of religion. It's a kind of fundamentalist form of religion which seeks to excommunicate heretics. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's very intolerant. Uh, it, it, it believes it's on the right side of history. It believes ha it has all the answers. So it has all the aspects of a religion. And of course, you can't persuade a faithful person that their God doesn't exist. That's not going to happen. So therefore, where are we here? And how, how can we... And I think the answer is very much, we just have to stop these high priests from gaining positions of power that you know everyone has the right to believe whatever they want and say whatever they want and i'm more than happy for people to hold these woke beliefs and to believe that the united kingdom is systemically racist and is underpinned by racism on every level uh and uh, etc they can believe that they can say it i'm all for that uh i don't want them um teaching kids that as though it's fact uh i don't want them in positions whereby uh, they will remove books from libraries if they don't sustain uh, their religious convictions or if they or they won't allow graduates to get onto a course unless they uh, acknowledge white guilt or etc. All, all the things that they are, in fact, implementing, uh, which is the difference between holding a religious belief and imposing your religious belief on other people. They can only impose it if they're in positions of power. It's the reason why so many people are now going to the courts because the high courts and the courts of appeal appear not to have been ideologically captured in the way that the lower courts have. So, so that on, on appeals, things tend to still work. My fear is that if, I mean, can you imagine if the Supreme Court in America or if the high court here became ideologically captured, then we'd be screwed, right? But there are still, there are still ways around this. There are still ways to 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 defeat it and um and the other thing is remembering that they are the minority that they just don't have the numbers and uh, you know i mean the, the, I've, I've just written a book about this it's called the new puritans it's about how we tackle this religion and the analogy i'm drawing on largely is is what happened in salem in massachusetts because what happened there uh was that most people from what i from what i've read it feels to me that most people understood that these accusations weren't authentic really uh you know because there are so many examples of where the girls accused a high-powered person in the community and they were told no you are mistaken this is not you rethink that right so uh in other words it, but no one would stand up because if they did if they said the girls everyone who said the girls are lying the girls are imagining these witches they're not real they they were the ones who were accused next so in order to overcome any kind of collective hysteria, which is, I think, what we're living through, uh, most people have to be brave. M when, when, when the numbers are there, when, when everyone is saying the emperor has no clothes, then it becomes safe to say the emperor has no clothes. At the moment, it's not, because anyone who does speak out tends to become a casualty of it. And I think the way out will be that there will be a lot of casualties, um, but ultimately, this, you know, you can't deny reality forever without the complicity of the populace and uh that's how tyranny happens and i don't think we have that complicity yet i think we just have people who are intimidated to the extent that they're they're, they're keeping quiet i keep getting messages from people saying i really wish i could say the things you're saying it doesn't matter to me because i can't be fired for saying the things i'm saying but for most people it really really does matter but i think there will become that that moment where you know and I think it's going to be things like the Leah Thomas thing, the NHS thing, the, the, the things that just everyone has a, a moment where they say enough is enough. You know, we've just got to say what's true. The question of um, how long we have to endure this 
um, is a really good one. What we need is a kind of uh, we we need a, a um, we need something to trigger. We need a kind of cascade of events to trigger a kind of uh, falling of the Berlin Wall moment. Um, and I think uh, you know the, the Free Speech Union strategy um, has always been to try and um, give people the confidence, the courage uh, to say what they think, to challenge some of this dogma, uh, to describe reality um, as they see it and not be cowed into um, pretending something that's in front of their eyes isn't there. And the way to do that is to provide them with some kind of insurance, some protection. So if they do speak out and uh, if they are punished for it, uh, we're there to defend them. And the hope is that if we if we have enough uh, big wins, if, we're, if we become better um, and we grow and we're able to kind of create this kind of bulwark of liberty, um, then more and more people will feel confident enough to speak out. It'll become crystal clear that it's only, as Andrew says, a tiny minority of kind of demented authoritarians that are out there enforcing this dogma. And when they're exposed in that way, then the Berlin Wall starts to crumble and we can live again. <laughs> um, so I don't think it will take uh, 70 years, but I think we, we need, we've got some work to do. Um, before we before we get to that Berlin Wall moment. Brilliant. Thank you, Toby. Um, Andrew, when's your new book out? Probably around June, I think. Okay. Uh, but, it, you know, I finished it. Um, the trouble is things happen every day where I think, oh, I should add that. Yeah. Because it, <laughs> it, it's, it is sort of nonstop. But ju just to back up what Toby's saying there, th those tweets I mentioned, the tr the live tweeting of the tribunal in the Mayo for Starter case, there's a point at which one of the identitarian people who would normally just say you're a transphobe you're a hateful hate monger but has to answer the question and he's asked about group identity the idea of identity and he says without identity there's just a corpse so they're talking about souls that's what that's what it is for them it so it, it, it the idea that it's religious is not you know it, i mean it's it's very close to the mark um and i think the more that they are subjected to scrutiny and the more that we put them in positions where they have to speak and defend themselves um you know maybe we can get get through it i hope it's over in like 10 15 years i want to be out of a job because i because i just don't like this stuff i just want uh -huh. it i just want it gone but yeah i think toby's right we just have we have a lot of work to do absolutely um well it's really great to see everybody's comments in the chat and i can tell that it is um it is uh, emboldening to, for people to come to these events and to actually know that there is, you know, really high level discussions going on about this. Um, I'd really recommend to people Andrew's book on free speech, um, free speech and why it matters. I would wave it, but it's on my Kindle, so that'd be pretty meaningless. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> So buy that one, read it and then w watch out for his new book coming along. We'll probably have Andrew back at some point. So um, Thank you, John. yeah, just I, I also do have a podcast called um, on GB News called uh, Free Speech Nation, the podcast. And I get to interview a lot of the people who have been cited in this in this discussion today. So it's 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 worth checking that out um, because they're extended long form. Brilliant. Um, I really appreciate you inviting me as well. I, I just want to reiterate that point. No, well, thank you. And you've been a very good friend of the uh, Free Speech Union for a long time, long before um, just your time that you've given this evening. So thank you very much. OK, thanks for coming, everybody. And uh, see you next time. Look, uh, keep an eye out for your emails coming from events so that you know what's going on. Great. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And try and persuade all your friends to join the Free Speech Union. <laughs>